It's hard to find a family that wasn't being affected by the Vietnam War inside of the barrios of the Southwest at that time. Some of my earliest memories are, are of looking at the photo album of my dad from Vietnam. Uh, you know, I mean, this, this old tattered army green, you know, photo album and thumbing through it and, you know, it was something that we talked about and that we knew about. What does that mean for the community as a whole when war was such a part of their life? In some communities, Vietnam has claimed an unusually high number of young men. Here is ABC's Dick Shoemaker with a report from Morency, Arizona. Morency is a small mining town in southeastern Arizona, the population about 6,000. A few years ago, nine boys from the local high school joined the Marines. Just on my street, I think there's only two people out of 12 houses that didn't have somebody in the service or still isn't in the service or didn't go in the Marine Corps, or Navy, or Air Force, Rangers, or Recon, or any of these other units. But everybody had a child, or a brother, or a sister, or a cousin in the service. I believe this whole county was very patriotic. It's what more or less was expected of you during that time. Your forefathers went to the service. My father went to the service. It was my duty to go also. Their whole concept was, if you're an American, then serve your country. You're no better, you're no worse than anybody, but just pay your dues just like everybody else has. We also come from a very strong military family, which goes all the way back to the Alamo. My father said, once you came into this country, he says, you owe your allegiance to this country. And my dad said, don't you forget that. So if another war happens to come up, you boys will serve your country. Francisco Coronado, he came through here, this whole area. That's why they call it a Coronado Trail. And they were basically following the river yeah. to get up, trying to look for the seven cities of mm -hmm. Cibola, mm -hmm. cities of gold. Cities of gold. Maybe they brought a geologist with them. Oh. But I don't know, but they walked right through big copper fields, you know. Growing up in Marinci, there was a lot of freedom. The area between our home and the San Francisco River was mountainous. It was adventurous. It gave us an opportunity to hunt a lot. operation of both towns was driven by the mine. And we played football in the tailings, but we always came out. Uh, our teeth were white, but then after playing in that white dirt, they turned green. And our throats were always scratchy because we're taking all the dust and stuff. We always had a smell like copper tailings. For the better part, until the early 1970s, it was a segregated town. You had your Angles living on one section, and the Hispanics and Blacks were on the same street. I thought all blacks could speak Spanish. <laughs> and I learned later on uh, that it wasn't 
they just learned it because they lived uh, right next door to to us. You had a choice of either going to the mines, working in the fields, or going into the service. Education wasn't uh, too much of an option. That's the way it was. All the Mexicans went to the smelter. <laughs> Nobody wanted to work in the smelter. It stunk, it was dirty, it was filthy. All the others would go to the cushy job, like in the machine shop, the powerhouse, uh, the pit, things like that. This is my brother-in-law's uniform. And I just thought I'd try it on and all that. Everybody said I was cheating because I got my picture taken in uniform before I left. But this is when they had already sent me the, the thing that I was to report to the selective service and all that. And that's just when we were drafted right here in Clifton. We were all young there. Most of those guys are still around. I joined the Army because I felt to me it was like a way out and I wanted to serve my country. I said, I, I need to serve my country. I, I, just, I just felt that the need to, you know? And, and also it was an escape for me to get out of here because I didn't have nothing. I knew early on that it was a good place to grow up, but it was not a place I was gonna live the rest of my life. I was not going to work for the mine. And I got a lot of friends and a lot of uh, relatives that felt the same way. In the case of the Marinci Marines, they're friends. One joins, they want to go together as a group. And they want to be part of that group. They want to be part of something. So it's March of 1966. Several of the young men are in English class, Miss Arnold's English class, and she announces a pop quiz. Right at that time, someone from the principal's office shows up and goes, all right, you come down and meet this Marine recruiter who had just come over from Globe, and we'll let you out of the pop quiz. I mean, they know exactly what stories to reach out to these young men with, about the promise of being the toughest fighters in the world, of getting to travel, to establish themselves as special. I was in study hall at the time, Larry West and I. I seen a Marine recruiter there in the counselor's office, and I just knew then I was gonna go in the Marine Corps. We decided to go in uh, all together. By the end of the day, he's got eight recruits with the ninth one on the way, Stan King being off at the University of Arizona. They almost run over each other in their race to their destiny. July 4th, 1966, they're boarding a bus and heading for San Diego. The day they left, we watched them get into the bus. Well, I shouldn't even say bus, it was like a suburban. They climbed in and they're all waving and as they drive away, their arms are stuck out the windows and they're waving. And then my cousin Johnny and I, we cruised. And then later that evening, uh, watched the uh, fireworks. Okay, it was 4th of July. To the media and in the outside world, they're called the Marinci Nine. But to a lot of us, uh, we just know them as individuals. They were hard ass. I mean, we knew these guys because these guys were all huge and big and tall. They're proud to be from Renzi. They're proud to be tough, hard nosed kids, especially when they get to the rifle range and can show the city boys how to shoot. The odds of dying in Vietnam were under 10%. So by that logic, in the case of the Marinci Nine, one should have died, if you take probabilities. Why does 66% die? Why this one group? Why?
Now picture yourself climbing up these hills when we were young with 80 pounds of back or gear on us. And you're coming as a platoon or a company, and then you're moving up to take the high ground. They would leave us like on this hill, and we had to get to that hill. And take the top of the mountain, that's where the battles would ensue up there. There's different sections in the memorial itself. Each one is dedicated to each war. This here is the Vietnam section. Uh, oh wow, did that break? Yeah. Wow. See? took the bolt off because there was another bolt on here I just came up here a couple of days ago and had a bolt on here this is very unfortunate this has never happened Anybody would want to do that. Well, there's always mischief, you know. Yeah. People in Greenland County didn't tolerate hippies. They didn't tolerate those anti-war uh, people. You didn't question. You didn't question the president. And I think it was especially strong in the Mexican American community because some people did question where was their loyalty? Was it to Mexico? even though many of the people actually have been here long before most Anglos arrived in the region. Military service was an out for them. It was an opportunity for them. And many would join in 63, 64, not ever thinking about Vietnam. And then by 66, 67, suddenly they're on the front lines at Con Tien, or in 68 in Khe Sanh, or around Da Nang, where the major battles are being fought. And they didn't anticipate that. When they gave you those exams in boot camp, you know, there was kids who couldn't read. You knew where they were going. I mean, they were going directly to infantry. The lower your education, the worse your English, the more likely you are to carry a gun into the field. And myself being a radio guy, humping that radio, I knew those crosshairs were always on my body somewhere. You're scared. I feared death. I feared it. The thing that scared me the most was artillery. I don't know why it, it, some, it didn't bother some people or whatever, but with me, it, 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 it scared the dickens out of me. We were grunts. We saw firsthand a lot of action. We saw firefight. We saw people die. We saw our buddies next to us die. We killed people. We killed gooks. They taught us that gooks aren't people. The military says, you kill that gook. That's what they are, gooks. They're not human. So it didn't bother us to kill gooks. That's what we were taught. When I was a little Mexican, <laughs> running around the deserts of Arizona, there was always this mystique about uh, tall white men with gray hair, running industry, running the military, running academies and colleges. And they deserved your respect. And in the military, that idea fell apart. People are screaming in my face, telling me what to do. 
and telling me things that I just don't believe. We're gonna, we're gonna go over there and kill indigenous people, you know. You lie in bed with a, it's a black dude in the next bed, you know, aren't, aren't we indigenous people? <laughs> yeah, we are. Why is this supposed to be exciting to me? It started wearing very thin rapidly. You couldn't conceive that maybe one of them or any of them would be killed. It was always a shock. My dad went to South Pacific, World War II, came home. Why wouldn't you think that the others would come home? I don't know. My dad was in some pretty Pretty brutal stuff, island hopping. Um, and he made it without a scratch. So why wouldn't you think that the others wouldn't? I, it, I don't know, it's, it's always a shock. It was a scary time from 66 all the way to 68. In 1968, there was four months in a row that there was a, a, there was a funeral here. fear anytime they seen two people in a uniform. That meant that they were gonna go to somebody's door and inform them that their son had just been killed. For a small county like this, uh, it uh, is quite a bit. There are a lot of Greenlee counties. You can go find them in many different parts of the country. And I think that's why this story means so much. It is a unique, it has unique characteristics, but it also has significant similarities with what other young men who left small towns uh, in 1960s and some died, some didn't come home. Others did come home and they bore the scars of what they'd seen in Vietnam. This is the grave of Clive Garcia. He was a Marine, 22 years old the last of six young men from the small town of Marinci, Arizona, to die fighting in Vietnam. The town population 6,000 is still in a state of shock. Clive is sort of the stereotype of the Marine. Had he lived, he probably would have been the Commodore of the Marine Corps at one point. I think he, he, was, gonna, he was gonna be a lifer. He was gonna be in there for a while. I met Clive one time uh, when I was back. Uh, I was a, a rifle instructor and a pistol instructor on a rifle range. And he said he volunteered to go to Vietnam. I pleaded with him not to go. I said, you're not missing anything if you don't go. But he was pretty adamant about it that he wanted to go. He would never feel like a Marine if he didn't go. And, I mean, I understood that, but I tried to talk him out of it anyways. He wanted to do his part. He didn't want to be the one left behind in garrison duty. I had a after-school job and I was working at the richest furniture store, Larry Taylor. He was married to the owner's daughter. He comes up and he goes, hey, Dan, you, you gotta go home. I said, no. It was a means to, to get money. And I didn't wanna go home. I, I wanna put in hours. I wanna be able to take the girlfriend out to a dinner and buy clothes and have gas money. 
he took me to the door and I told him, I don't want to go. And he kicked me in the ass. He says, you go home, your parents need you. I walked in the door to the living room and there stood two Marines. I kept saying, I kept saying no. The radio man, he tripped a bouncing buddy. That's a mine that jumps and then explodes. And he was killed instantly. Clive was wounded bad. And when the medevac finally came, because there were definitely so many clicks on the South Vietnam side, he said your brother was able to see the medevac hover start to come down, but he died in my arms. church was packed. I remember sitting there and then my dad stepping up and leaving. He went outside. My younger brother did too. I wanted to stand up and leave. I remember my mom grabbing me and she says, not you. You stay. And so I stayed. I stayed there next to her through the funeral. <laughs> it took a lot. It took a lot to get her upset. We do not question and we do not become bitter because we believe that this was God sent and, and we accept him and we thank him for the many blessings he has given us. I've said over and over, you know, he lent him to us. I can't in any way disgrace the Corps or any part of the service. This is not right. This is not our belief, you know. But uh, the, the grief, the sorrow is, is too much, you know. And, and again, with the grace of God, we're able to bear it. It's got to be brutally tougher on a mother than a brother. It's got to be. A lot of us didn't know how to react to this civilian life, so to say. And that's why a lot of veterans would never say they were veterans, because we were baby killers. We were murderers. We were everything but human. So I, I never let anybody know I was a veteran. Never. I came back a different person because of my experiences that I learned. And I was really disappointed when I got back to Camp Pendleton, they asked me where I wanted to go. I had a choice. I could go to New York because I had my job waiting for me in New York in the bank. Or I could go on, you know, to Puerto Rico. I decided I wanted to go to Puerto Rico because I was so disgusted in the fact that people didn't treat us the way we were supposed to be treated. I, I felt like dirt. The end of the war, there's no such thing to a Vietnam vet at the end of the war. The war never goes away. 
Some people fight it every day. Some people are on the battlefields every day. Some people, when they hear a, a, a chopper, you know, a helicopter, instantaneously throws you back into the Nam. Smells, rain. What do we learn from this? Don't go to war. There are over 1,800 dog tags hung on the cables between the flags from different wars, conflicts. We started by honoring the veterans from Vietnam who were killed from Greenlee County, and these are their dog tags in there. So we started with them first to honor them and went on from there. These are the, the newer ones here. These are the newer dogs. The only thing that we did that was different or wrong is that we didn't ask, why are we going to war? Why do we have to kill people? Why do we have to do this? We just did what we were taught to do. But a lot of mainstream America, young America, they were questioning that. They were doing things that weren't done before. They were voicing their opinions and actions and by voice. The questions that were asked during the Vietnam War, why are we fighting and dying? Why is US citizenship, why is this like one of the best and most secure ways to obtain equal rights within this country? Why is this a price that we need to pay? Those continue to resonate today. Whether or not you are pro or anti-war, um, Chicanos served in Vietnam, and they came back. And my question is, what did that do to our communities? What did that do to their understanding of themselves as men and women? What did that do to our understanding of what a community is, of what our place is inside of the nation as a whole? What did it do to their lives, to the 40 years that they've spent alive since coming back from Vietnam? On Two Fronts, Latinos in Vietnam is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. On Two Fronts, Latinos in Vietnam was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 